So one day, Jesus was praying, and when he finished, his disciples came up to him, and one of them said, hey Jesus, teach us to pray. Now we generally think that the disciples as something of spiritual all-stars. I mean, Jesus handpicked these guys to follow him. Jesus picked them because they had their spiritual life together, right? Apparently not. By this time, the disciples had followed Jesus for roughly about a year, and they still didn't know how to pray. So they caught Jesus in the act and asked him to teach them how to do it. Now, if you are anything like me, you totally identify with the disciples in this moment. As your pastor, maybe I should not admit this to you, but I find prayer to be pretty difficult. For example, whenever my pastor friends and I get together for an event, we often get in a circle and hold hands, and then I get this nervous little ball in the pit of my stomach because I know someone is about to give the dreaded instructions. Let's pray. We'll go around the circle and just pray as the Spirit moves you. Well, I've noticed during those moments that the Spirit moves other people really well during this prayer time. But the Spirit does not move me really well. So as we go around the circle, my pastor friends usually give some really deep, poetic, extemporaneous prayers. As we go around the circle, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit moves someone to put an end to this by saying amen before it gets to my turn. But soon enough, it's my turn. And my voice quivers as I get increasingly nervous and I say something that sounds totally ridiculous to my ears, like, hi God, how's it going? Well, the world is pretty awesome, thanks for it, but there are some really pretty messed up things going on down here. Could you please do something about that? Because we are trying and apparently we need your help. Okay. Thanks for listening. And then because I'm so nervous, I forget that you aren't supposed to say amen until the last person says it. I say amen, and I make the whole thing even more awkward. So I totally identify with the disciples when they ask Jesus, could you teach us to pray? And maybe the disciples had similar questions about prayer that I'm sure that you and I have. Prayer questions like, hey, Jesus, before you even teach us how to pray, could you teach us why we should pray in the first place? Do we pray in order to change God's mind? Do we pray so that we can defeat our political enemies? Because they're really messing things up, aren't they? Do we pray for financial gain, worldly success, and popularity? Because we tend to think those things would be awesome. By the way, does prayer make us more selfish and narcissistic? Should we simply offer thoughts and prayers to people suffering tragedy because thoughts and prayers is a convenient way of letting ourselves off the hook from actually making any changes in this world? You will be glad to know that I'm going to answer all of these questions in the next 10 minutes. Ready? Here's one of the things that I love about Jesus in this passage today. Whenever he teaches about prayer, his instructions are basically kiss. You know, keep it simple. I don't know if I can say it on the pulpit. Stupid, yes, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Jesus instructs the disciples by modeling them for them what to say. Jesus' prayer is, get this, five short sentences and less than 40 words. When it was read this morning, were you like, what is that? Because when we say it after our prayer times, we've added a whole bunch of words to it, right? But Jesus is just saying, just keep it simple. 40 words is enough. When Jesus teaches about prayer in other passages, he states that we should not heap up all kinds of words in order to make ourselves look smart or holier than others. Just relax. 
during prayer. Because some people have a gift of offering up beautiful prayers, and I thank God for that gift. But if you are like me and prayer just feels awkward, that's okay. It's okay to just say what is on your mind. It is okay to keep it short. And it is okay to even say nothing at all during prayer and just listen. Sometimes the best, best prayers are silent. But if you do use words, Jesus advises that when you pray, start by saying, Father, And right here we need to stop because this very first word is problematic for many of us because we already have a problem. What's with this father language that Jesus uses? Jesus is always calling God father. Isn't that just patriarchal language and shouldn't we leave that to the ancient world? Haven't we grown beyond this father language of God? Well, it sounds a bit counterintuitive. But when Jesus called God Father, he was subverting the patriarchal norms of his day and of our day. How is that? Because in ancient Roman Empire where Jesus lived, the head of the household was called the pater familias. Pater means father, and familias means family. The pater familias was the oldest living male in the house, and he called all the shots. The pater familias had the power of life and death over family members. The Roman patriarchal system was often and easily abused with violence and without any repercussions because of this father system having all the power. But is that what Jesus meant when he called God Father? Some say yes. Some claim that God is all-powerful and God can violently coerce if God wants to. But in his prayer, Jesus reveals that God is nothing like the pater of the Roman Empire. In fact, the New Testament scholar Joel Green states that Jesus reveals the fatherhood of God to his disciples and in doing so defines in what sense it is appropriate to call God Father. In an environment in which fathers wielded such far-reaching and coercive and violent power, it was important that the fatherhood of God be qualified in terms of generosity, of compassion, of care, and faithfulness, faithful activity on behalf of God's children. Now, the next part of the prayer is typically translated as, Father, hallowed be your name. Okay, in your everyday lives, who among us uses the word hallowed? Nobody, right? Why do we use that in this prayer? When you're at the grocery store and you see something that looks really good and your mouth starts to water, do you ever say, wow, that is some hallowed food right there? Thank you, Jesus. No, nobody uses that word. What does it even mean? Our translation says, hallowed be your name. But I like other translations of this passage better. In the original Greek language of Luke, the phrase is dynamic and active. Jesus is not merely describing God's name as holy. Jesus is imploring God to make God's name holy. One translation puts it like this, Father, uphold the holiness of your name. Why would Jesus pray that God would uphold the holiness of God's name? Now, I know that this seems really hard for us to understand, but before and during the time of Jesus, there were religious leaders who gave God a bad name. (laughs) They did not uphold the holiness of God's name. In fact, they gave God a bad name by justifying violent and corrupt political policies. For example, there was once a prophet named Jeremiah Jeremiah is described as a true prophet, and he lived during a time when there were many false 
prophets. Jeremiah was a true prophet because he upheld the holiness of God's name by caring about the things that God cared about. For example, God told Jeremiah to go to the king of Israel and tell him to, quote, act with justice and righteousness. And how does a king act with justice and righteousness? By delivering from the hand of the oppressed anyone who has been robbed. This is economic justice. And by doing no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow. To not shed innocent blood throughout the land. As opposed to Jeremiah, there were false prophets who merely told the king what the king wanted to hear. That he didn't have to care about the poor or those who had been robbed. That he didn't have to care about economic justice. In fact, the economic system of the time benefited the king and his rich friends, who constantly exploited the poor because the poor had no one to defend them. During Jeremiah's time, foreigners were often scapegoated. They were wronged. They were attacked. They were blamed for all the problems of the nation. False prophets justified treating foreigners with hatred and contempt. The orphans and the widows were the most vulnerable poor members of the society, and false prophets told the king that he had no responsibility towards them. And in doing so, the prophets did not care about what God cared about, and in this way, the false prophets did not uphold the holiness of God's name. There was a similar situation in Jesus' day. There was a huge gap between rich and poor. Many of the religious elites during his day justified that gap because they benefited from it. So they didn't challenge the king to help the poor. But as Jesus continues his prayer, he prays that the Father's kingdom would come down here on earth. Do you see how politically subversive this prayer is? The king at the time was a man named Herod. It was Herod's kingdom. The king, the kingdom of God is radically different from the kingdom of Herod. It's radically different from the empire of Rome. It's a place where, despite economic status, everyone has their daily bread. For, every, for their daily need is met because we share with one another in our daily needs. It's a place where we refuse to live by cycles of violence and vengeance and instead live by the cycle of forgiveness. And here I want to be careful about this word forgiveness because quite often people get the impression that you must forgive whatever that person did to you. And this demand to forgive can often be a horrible burden on many of us. But the Greek word in this passage for forgive is ephiemi. Ephiemi actually means to let go or to disregard or to keep no longer. Sometimes forgiveness or ephiemi might lead us to reconcile with someone who has hurt us in the past. But there are times when people have hurt us so bad that we may need to do ephiemi which means that we may need to let go of the person who has hurt us. We may need to no longer keep that person in our lives as we just simply create space between us. I've gone on for too long already. Uh, There's so much to say about this passage, but I want to end on a little word of hope. Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. Jesus here is not saying, just ask God for a million dollars and it will be given to you. Jesus is not saying, just believe in God and you will never suffer in this world. For even Jesus went to the cross and suffered. What Jesus is saying is that God wants us to knock on the door. God wants us to search for it. God wants us to ask for it. But what is it that we should search for? What is it that we should ask for? Because what we search for matters. 
What we ask for matters. Not all doors are good. So which doors should we knock on? The it that Jesus wants us to search for and to ask for is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of love. Jesus wants us to knock on the door that it will lead to us to the Holy Spirit. And this is why prayer matters. Prayer is not meant to change God's mind. It is meant to change our mind. Prayer is meant to make us more like the Holy Spirit of God. But remember that God is nothing like the violent and coercive father of the paterfamilia. Rather, God is like the father who wants to feed us all with good bread, good food, so that we can share our food with those in need. God forgives us so that we might change cycles of violence in this world into cycles of forgiveness. God opens the door for us so that we can open the door for one another and especially to those who have so often had the doors shut in their lives. We cannot simply offer empty phrases like thoughts and prayers anymore. That attitude is the attitude of false prophets who give God a bad name. Jesus implored that the Father uphold the holiness of the divine name, but God isn't going to do it alone. You and I have a mission. It's a holy mission. God knows there are a lot of people giving God a bad name by not caring for the poor and the homeless, by scapegoating immigrants, by stoking the flames of racism and Islamophobia, by treating our LGBTQ siblings with contempt, and by threatening to take away women's rights. But we are called to live a different way. We are called to live into God's kingdom. Jesus was the embodiment of that kingdom, and he invites us to knock on the door and walk through it together as we boldly follow Jesus in working and praying for a more just world. May we continue to do so today and forevermore. Amen. Hi, everyone. This is Adam Erickson, reminding you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Clackamas United Church of Christ. We are located at 15303 Southeast Webster Road in Milwaukee, Oregon. We are so glad that you found this podcast. All of our podcasts will always be free, but we rely on the financial support of our members and our friends. If this podcast meant something to you, you can help us out in two ways. You can share this podcast with someone you think might be interested. You can also help us financially by donating to the wonderful missions we have here at Clackamas United Church of Christ. To do so, you can go to our Facebook page, our website, or our YouTube channel and click on the Donate Here button. Our worship services start at 1030 on Sundays, except for during the summer months when we start at 10 o'clock. If you would like more information on our church, you can visit our website at c-ucc.org. You can also reach out to me through email at adam at c-ucc.org. Until next time, grace and peace be with you.